we think it's actually quite promising in, in India over the next five years. Um, currently, in 2015, India invested about $10 billion into renewable energy, so mostly in solar and, and bit in wind and some other technologies. Uh, that's a pretty good number, $10 billion, but it's still uh, quite a ways behind uh, countries like Japan, which is almost $50 billion, and China, which is over $100 billion la uh, last year. Uh, however, India is uh, a major economy, and it's one of the fastest growing uh, major economies in the world. Uh, and also now the government has set a uh, fairly ambitious renewable energy target of uh, you know, over 100 gigawatts of solar by 2022 and over uh, 60 or 70 gigawatts of wind by that year as well. So we think that investment and activity will really pick up in India over the next uh, couple of years. Uh, and we're really looking forward to uh, seeing how that will develop. Um, in some ways, India is, is a fairly open market uh, in the way that it allows a lot of international investment uh, developers, financiers, equipment manufacturers already to participate in the market. So in, in that sense, it's uh, already a bit different than some of the other uh, major solar or, or renewable energy markets in the world. Uh, we see that one thing that India has done well over the past couple of years uh, is with its solar auctions, both the auctions that are held by the different states, but also the uh, also held by the federal government as well. Uh, the auctions of, of solar projects has really helped bring down the cost of uh, solar projects and really increase the deployment of these uh, projects across uh, various states. Um, so I think India, uh, you know, needs really just to stay on this course, uh, sort of keep on with its ambitious targets. Uh, but also uh, seek out more uh, uh, sources of uh, f financing uh, and other sort of uh, uh, deployment mechanisms to really uh, accelerate its growth. It's difficult in, in some ways, uh, and different markets have different uh, conditions when it comes to financing. Uh, the cost of finance in India generally has been higher than, than many other markets. Uh, for instance, if you look at uh, Japan and China, which is the two other major investors in renewable energy in, in the Asia-Pacific region, uh, typically financing for its largest companies uh, that are building energy projects is, is much cheaper than what you see in India. Uh, a lot of it is actually driven by government, central government support or corporate financing of, of projects. Uh, I think the nature of, of, uh, of, of financing in India is a bit different than that of China and Japan. So uh, it's, we, we can't really say that that model really works here in India. But I think India uh, clearly has other ways of, of, uh, of bringing down the cost of finance and also uh, deploying its resources. I think India has um, a, a number, there's a number of models that India could really adopt. Um, I think a lot of the, uh, uh, we're looking, actually we're doing some work right now looking at innovative uh, ways of financing that are happening in India. So both, uh, traditionally there's always been sort of bank financing, uh, there's, there's sort of government backed bank financing, uh, there's also financing and support from international uh, uh, multilateral organizations such as the development banks. Uh, but now we also are looking at uh, 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 sort of issuances of green bonds, uh, yield codes, um, and also sort of uh, even more um, crowdfunding for, for, uh, for solar projects. A lot of different new innovative uh, methods now are, are coming into play. So I think it's, um, I guess the answer is that it's hard to say there is one single uh, silver bullet to sort of unlocking the potential financing uh, in India or really one thing that will accelerate everything. It really has to be a combination of different, uh, uh, a variety of different, different sources and a variety of different methods. Yes, um, I think it's a combination of, uh, of, of supporting both uh, entrepreneurs, new companies, uh, new innovative business models that are coming into the market uh, and also uh, sort of supporting your existing power companies uh, that are doing the deployment. Um, we see that sort of the large, really large financing and renewable energy projects that have taken place in other countries have come from large companies, actually. They haven't really come from startups or, 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 or really uh, many of the new, new, uh, new companies out there. However, that's not to say that there are no sort of disruptive business models or new things that can happen that can change the, the landscape. So it really is a combination of both that you need. We did, when we did our long-term forecast, um, we, uh, which is over actually 25 years uh, instead of 5 or 10 years, 
uh, Asia Pacific region actually uh, needs more uh, investment in renewable energy and energy in general than any other part of the world. Uh, actually, more than all the other parts of the world combined. Uh, that's certainly true in the next five years. I think in the next five years, we're going to see a really interesting uh, period of, of, of sort of somewhat uncertainty, but also transition. Um, we have a case where fossil fuels are actually very cheap right now. Oil prices are low, coal is, is, is relatively cheap. Uh, gas prices are coming down, but at the same time, renewable energy prices are also coming down very, very rapidly. So we're entering a period of, of really abundance in energy sources and a lot of competition between uh, both traditional and new energy sources, uh, which probably is actually a good thing for developing economies in Asia, because uh, especially in countries like India and Southeast Asia, where the economies and power demand growth is, is expanding rapidly, uh, these sort of lower costs or cheaper sources of energy will be beneficial to these countries. Uh, on the other hand, we actually see a um, bit more slowdown occurring in uh, countries like China and Japan at the moment, uh, both uh, as you know, economic growth slows and power demand growth slows. Uh, we think that a lot of the investment into energy actually will be shifting now towards uh, other developing countries in Asia. Well, certainly subsidies are, are useful for deployment of renewable energy. Um, without subsidies, we would never really be able to drive down the cost of renewable energy to the levels that we see today. So, um, you know, as we heard at this uh, event earlier, uh, Germany was one of the first countries to deploy uh, large-scale subsidies for renewable energy, and that has really helped bring down the cost of, of renewable energy. Um, in India as well, there's, there's subsidies both actually for fossil fuels and for renewable energy. Um, so subsidies have their place, they're very important, um, but however, I think subsidies should be deployed very carefully. Um, there is uh, increasingly a risk of over-subsidizing the industry as well, because as you have cost of solar and wind coming down so rapidly, uh, what is actually the right subsidy level for them? It's, it's very difficult to keep, uh, keep on track in terms of making sure that your subsidy level is actually appropriate to the cost of the technology. Uh, which is why now we see more and more market mechanisms now being uh, used uh, to deploy renewable energy, such as the auctions, the solar auctions that are taking place across the various states in India. Um, these auctions are helpful, they're useful, because they actually help provide a benchmark for what the actual cost of uh, renewable energy should be uh, in terms of their deployment. Some differences significantly, um, both uh, sort of in positive and, and negative ways. Um, and uh, I think one of the positive ways is that you know India is clearly a big market uh, with a lot of potential. Uh, there is a lot of room for growth. Um, again, you know we have uh, sort of uh, 300 million people without electricity in India, and then it's still undergoing a process of industrialization. On a per capita basis, uh, India's uh, electricity uh, consumption is far lower than that of, of China or, or Japan or any other country. So basically all that says to, to businesses and investors is that there's a lot of room for growth in, in India for new, new energy, new power. Um, some of that will come from conventional sources obviously, but increasingly more and more of that is going to come from renewable energy. So that's one of the, the, the plus sides and, and sort of good potentials uh, in, in India. On the other hand, uh, sometimes the environment, uh, investment environment in India is, is challenging. Um, you have different policies across different states, uh, which means that there are some are more attractive than others, and, and, and sort of you, you have a different uh, level of risk when you invest in different places. Uh, the discoms or the, the distribution uh, sort of companies that buy electricity also have different, um, uh, different uh, levels of financial solvency, so that's often uh, what we call counterparty risk in the industry. Um, the fact that if you build a solar project and you sell it to the grid, uh, will it always be able to pay you uh, your tariffs on time? And that's certainly uh, across different uh, uh, companies or different states in India, there's also different levels of risk uh, behind that as well. So, uh, you know, it, it's a large and diverse place. So I think in some ways investors do see a lot of opportunity and potential for growth, um, but they have to navigate the risks across different, uh, different states. Uh, and that's qu actually quite different than uh, other countries uh, in Asia which have deployed renewable energy uh, a bit earlier, such as in Japan or China, uh, which tend to have fairly unified national policies. I don't know in all the sort of in detail uh, of in terms of the business regulations in, in India. I, I mean, there's always um, 
uh, one could say that you can, every country has red tape and, and actually a lot of barriers uh, as well, different kinds of barriers. Um, some ways, I think a lot of investors still see India as a fairly open market, uh, even though there are numerous challenges uh, in terms of putting projects in place here and, and putting money here. Uh, many international companies do come to India, and they actually do, they do come to India more than so than they come to some countries in Southeast Asia or into China or to Japan because they, they see the, the opportunity here. The question about whether uh, you know, government or, or others can do more to facilitate investment, um, yes, obviously there is there's much more that can be done to, to help, but uh, clearly I think now that we see a lot of uh, foreign companies, you know, utilities from Europe, from Southeast Asia, even uh, companies from China and Japan showing interest in investing in India shows that actually they view that there is uh, a lot of potential and still you know, openness here for, for business.